Good afternoon. I do not have as good an accent as he, but um, thank you all for coming. Uh, the, uh, the schedule today is we're going to hear from three experts in the industry, uh, and then there'll be some questions and answers, which I'm going to ask a couple of questions, but I, it's my job to encourage all of you to ask lots of questions. Uh, my name is Sam Poser. I'm an equity analyst for Susquehanna International and I cover the footwear and apparel industry and spent about 20 years in that business prior to doing that. So, uh, uh, and this is new to me, but I do know, you know what the investment community likes to hear about. Uh, and I think I know what the retailers and some of the brands like to hear about as well. So um, with that, um, I'm gonna introduce uh, Frederico, Frederico Brigno, Brignoli, did I say it right? Fred, Frederico Brignoli, I'm sorry. And um, he's gonna discuss how fashion and brands, uh, how fashion brands and sustainability uh, sustainability uh, uh, interrelate. Um, he, um, he is from Milan. Uh, he graduated with honors in, in 1997 in environmental sciences. He has, he has been committed to sustain sustainability from the beginning of his professional career as an entrepreneur. 2008, he founded Spin360, a company that promotes new sustainable business models and technological and organizational innovative solutions. Uh, among other things, I will not read through the entire thing, but um, I will introduce Federico, and he's got a good presentation for everybody. Thank you. Here we are. Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> um, I have 38 slides, so my presentation is gonna, it's not going to be very short, but I hope it's going to be interesting for all of you. Um, I'm going to be speaking, as Sam said, about how sustainability and the fashion industry interrelate. We have carried out uh, a specific research uh, investigating the approach to sustainability in over 140 brands internationally and in tanneries representing more than 25% of the total turnover in Italy. A few words on who we are. It has been said already. We are 20 people working very hard. Uh, with a set of competencies that has been evolving in time and now managing sustainability in international supply chains does not require only simple competences. Uh, we are experts in environmental protection, social compliance, auditing, but also in software development and in the, in the uh, setting up of innovative tools that allow our customers to uh, manage properly the sustainability topic in their supply chain. Who our uh, customers are, uh, mainly brands, industrial associations, uh, tanneries and chemical producers in the whole supply chain, uh, especially in the leather business. Well, I will start by uh, speaking and sharing with you what has been uh, the evolution of the meaning of the term sustainability. It first came out in business in 1987 when Mr. Brunland, a very smart and intelligent researcher, then he has been commissioned by the United Nations on uh, writing a report. So he, he developed the term sustainable development. That is uh, a development that meets the need of the present but not compromise the, 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 the right or the ability of future generation to meet their own needs. There are three spheres of interest in sustainable development, the economic one, of course, but then social and environmental as well. So it's a balanced, um, a, a balanced kind of growth. Uh, we have witnessed in time uh, an explosion of different requirements uh, on sustainability, and in particular in the, in the fashion industry. I think most of you are also familiar with the uh, very bad event that occurred in Bangladesh recently, 2013, the so-called Rana Plaza, that gave a boost to the pressure, in, starting from the textile and clothing industry, but also in, in other supply chains, on the control of sustainable practices along the supply chain. 1997 was the year in which the first ISO standard um, was issued, issued on environmental topics, the ISO 14001. And now, as we will see also later on, there is a huge proliferation of different standards and labels. This is something that I like to say. It's kind of a funny slide. Uh, a recent research by the World Watch Institute. What you see there 
is a, uh, the interrelation of points in the number of times that the word sustainability is, uh, is pronounced on Google. So if the trend keeps on going uh, like it is in 2109, all the sentences will be made only by the word sustainability repeated over and over again. Why am I saying so? Because it is really important, in our opinion, to have a concrete approach to this term, not to speak about it, but to do something. You know, it's, it's very easy to say, let's do it right. But do it right is not just a matter of not having children working in your own supply chain. It is also a matter of guaranteeing business continuity to your own brand and company. Again, 1997, uh, here we have two sets of the supply chain of the leather business. One is referring to the, the bottom one with the raw hides uh, purchase, and the other one is chemicals. Uh, in 1997, the approach was only on the production side. From gate to gate, you had to be sure that you were not polluting or that you were doing as much as possible to reduce pollution in your own factory. Now what is required by uh, the supply chain and by the market is to have an integrated approach. There are several uh, actions on chemical safety, there are several actions on animal welfare and traceability of raw materials, um, and uh, therefore also the complexity of managing this topic has been increasing over time. This is why we have been forced as a company to develop all the competencies that I was telling you about. Which are the drivers of this change? Well, there are some good ones and some bad ones. And the international trends, you probably know uh, that the United Nations have just issued the new uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, there has been a good uh, result, a very good result in Paris, where for the first time, the first agreement on climate change has been signed. Uh, in Europe, at least, we have a very strong legislative evolution on, on the topic. Some bad ones are proliferation of uh, aggressive campaigns uh, for which organizations are like um, targeting uh, big companies and brands, the bigger the better, uh, in order to create a mood for change. Um, well, we see PETA here, Greenpeace, or an aggressive campaign against leather shoes that has been uh, issued in, in Europe recently. And then the market itself is self-regulating the, the, this topic, like there in the middle you see the ZDHC group, Zero Discharge of Hazardous Chemicals, is a group of international brands uh, representing in total more than $200 billion of turnover, yearly turnover, who are working together in order to phase out hazardous substances for their production, from their production. So we see and we will see later on that this is a trend that is going on and is not going to come back. It is an irre irreversible trend towards a better way of producing leather or other goods in the fashion supply chain. Another peculiarity of sustainability is like that uh, as Icarus, the mythological Greek um, character, uh, I can say the higher you fly, the harder you fall. The biggest mistake that a company can do in speaking about sustainability is communicating or having foundations uh, funding um, the development of good practices in Africa without controlling their own supply chain. That would be the biggest mistake. So it's not good to communicate without implementing first actions in their own company. How to do that? Uh, it's a good option to start engaging suppliers, and this is what we do also when we work with brands. We start talking with, uh, with, with our suppliers, safeguard them, make them uh, aware of which are the objectives of, uh, of the different uh, steps, um, be transparent, and I think uh, also in the United States market, the transparency is a key and consumer trust is a key as well. Uh, and as I said, what uh, is really not needed and mm, negative is to reinvent the wheel. The requirements of sustainability are there since years, so it's really difficult for the supply chain to keep on managing new sets of requirements set up by brands. We have companies who are signing contracts with big brands internationally, and they also have a list of technical specifications on sustainability, which 
increase in number every year. So harmonize is another key word. And of course, greenwashing is the activity that can bring the, uh, the highest risk on, the, on, on this topic. In the past, as I said, there was a traditional approach. <clears throat> and the traditional approach was branding, uh, brands defining requirements on chemical safety, on absence of child labor or whatsoever. And then they have been st starting auditing their supply chains. This has created a huge market also for auditors which is now really starting to be too much and not cost effective. We're coming here in order to propose a new way to operate and my colleague Giacomo later on will, will tell you a little bit more on that. This uh, attitude has created what we think is really something very strange. If you go on the site ecolabelindex.com, you will see that the, at present, this was done yesterday or the day before, there are 465 eco-labels in the world. So having 465 eco-labels means having zero, because no one of them has enough strength and power to be internationally recognized. This is the first problem we see. Uh, having 465 eco-labels means having a lack of comprehensiveness. None of them can take all the different requirements of sustainability. It is difficult for you. I, I think some of you has already started or searching which is the certification scheme I can trust, possibly. Or uh, is there a scheme that I can ask my supplier to follow in order to be compliant and not to have any risk on my supply chain? But it's very difficult with this huge number to have uh, a good orientation. And of course, this need, leads to a dispersion of resources. Instead of working on 465 different labels, working on few of them uh, effectively can be, can be much, more, uh, much better in, uh, in, uh, in risk management. So this is one of the reasons why we have decided to call this conference Disrupting Sustainability. We also received some comments. We're not native uh, English speakers, as you may notice, so disrupting may have a negative uh, um, um, meaning. This is a, really exactly the opposite of what we mean. I just brought here the definition by the Cambridge Dictionary, which is much more <laughs> reliable than myself. Uh, and really, we're working on uh, a way to change the traditional way in which an industry operates uh, in, to provide a new and effective way. So this is the only reason why we have decided to use this word disruptive, which means a clear, a clear distinction between what happened in the past and what's going to be in the future. To do this, we have complex issue, complex supply chain, um, and therefore we, can, we need to avoid to be simplistic because this would mean greenwashing or creating the conditions for increasing the risk instead of diminishing that. Uh, but we are in the fashion business and we want to uh, get to an elegant simplicity. An elegant simplicity means a good way of operating in cooperation in different actors of, of the supply chain. How to do that? Instead of uh, working only on audits, there is a larger business strategy that should be embedded in the company uh, decisions, which takes into consideration mainly four factors. Uh, the first one is to know the supply chain. There is a great difference in risk management on these topics. If you order on Alibaba, for example, and you just wait your order to come back and then you pay the bill or you pay, you pay the 50% balance, then having a proper and personal relationship with your suppliers. Proximity does not only mean a geographical proximity, it is also cultural proximity. Comprehensive and balanced contracts, uh, not 250 pages uh, each supplier, which leads to an inherent complexity, but all the things that need to be there. Um, being able to to manage the supply chain by this meaning that uh, in this topic it is really important also to know and to invest on the relationship with your suppliers so having the possibility of choosing and keeping consolidated relationships and then of course controls why not uh, but limited and focused 
without auditing. Uh, we have examples of uh, tanneries in Italy who receive, I don't know, three audits a, a month uh, from different customers, all asking the same questions. <laughs> so it's like they can put a record or they can fill the, themselves and uh, give in the, the same document because the questions are more or less always the same. So how to guide, how companies can guide themselves and how the, the supply chain can, can guide. There is a very simple uh, methodology that is recognized and is uh, the risk management by a very simple definition of risk, which is the probability of occurrence of a negative event times the possible consequences. I think it's very clear, not very difficult to... To, to understand, and the risk being assessed is which are the effects on non-sustainable behaviors or practices in someone's supply chain on the different actors of the ladder, supply chain itself. So what if uh, uh, a brand is, is found guilty of uh, uh, having non-sustainable practices? We were discussing before in Italy recently, on a Sunday night, there was a, um, a TV show showing a non-sustainable behavior of a brand. I'm not going to tell you the name, of course. On the following day, this brand lost 144 million euros on the stock exchange in one day. Then it's slightly recovered. But this didn't create bankruptcy or really heavy consequences because they were wealthy at that time. But what if they would have been in a pretty risky situation already. So it is, just, it is not just a matter of, uh, you know, uh, pulling flowers around your supply chain. It is also a matter of properly managing the businesses, which are then the factors that are affecting probability. Of course, it is different. I'm not going to say something negative, but it's different if you purchase or you buy your raw material in Italy or in Bangladesh. Uh, I just said Bangladesh because it's a famous place for the event of Rana Plaza. But the key factors are the legislative framework. In Italy, we have uh, specific laws on environmental protection since 60 years. The law enforcement. We have, I have been traveling all over Asia. The law uh, were perfect, but then there were no controls and no enforcement. So there were a lot of paper printed, mm -hmm. but staying in drawings. So, and the controls which are already in place by public authorities. So country is very important. As I said, the engagement and the knowledge that a brand has on its suppliers, the kind of contacts and the type of controls, which are then the, the possible consequences. Of course, there are two, the two on the bottom, which are clearly direct, an impact on humans and an impact on the sustainability of local communities. There are two that are more uh, let's say business related, one is economic. It is very probable that in a B2, B2B relationship, business to business, that if uh, a supplier is found guilty of non-sustainable behavior, that from the following day, the contract is stopped. Uh, so it's a loss of turnover, it's a loss of brand value, it's brand reputations. Um, and of course, also legal liability. Mm -hmm. We are witnessing an evolution of um, the, this term so that uh, in Europe there are also legislations uh, on the uh, so-called extended liability, meaning that if a brand has uh, enough uh, power to uh, orientate management decision in one of its suppliers, they can be considered liable if something wrong happens in the supplier itself. So, again, it's, it's something that is really now embedded in business decisions. If we're speaking about economic risks, this is well, a very simplistic representation of the leather supply chain from raw material down to retail, and the curve represents the level of risk. We have studied this, and we have seen that the economic risk is higher in the central part, where tanneries are. Again, why? Because it is really probable that their contracts and their customers will go somewhere else immediately, right away, if non-sustainable behavior are found. But of course, also brands have their own risk, uh, which, is, which are a little bit reduced. First of all, because the number of customers is huge if compared to the B2B relationship. 
And secondly, because the power of brands is still very strong on consumers. Now the second question is, how is it possible to orientate decisions? So we have created what I co called, it is my fault, the curve of influence. It is not a very nice name, but in any case, it represents the fact that if uh, like a brand over uh, a tannery has a lot of influence because the tannery, the brand normally represents a high portion of the turnover of the tannery and there are, uh, uh, there are not as many brands as tanneries, so the, the, the number of potential customers is reduced. This is different in the rawhide business purchase. A meat packer can sell uh, leather to rawhides to whoever in the world. Uh, the, the, the raw hides are a commodity, which is traded in 183 countries or 184. So the situation, the leverage to, to um, orientate the decision is very different. I'm going to go just a little bit more in detail now, up to the results of our presentation. There is one standard that is uh, carried out and has been developed by ISO. It's called ISO 26000 and it refers to uh, sustainability in a holistic approach. They try to include everything. Um, based on this, we have uh, elaborated a risk management model on five of these uh, uh, requirements, human rights, labor practices, environmental protection, fair operating practices, fair competition, and consumer issues. Uh, we're not going to go very much in detail. Uh, in any case, all our presentations will be sent to you or an abstract of, of those, so uh, you don't need to take notes or pictures. Of course, if you want to take pictures, you're welcome, and I would be proud to see you taking pictures of my slides. But, <laughs> but in any case, uh, these five uh, uh, core issues uh, are then uh, spread out in 26 uh, requirements. For example, in, in the human rights, uh, there is a human rights risk. In, uh, in uh, um, uh, conditions of work, uh, we have the import very important topic of health and safety in the workplace, in the, in the supply chain, and so on and so forth. What we have done is we have created a matrix based on these 26 requirements. And then we have analyzed uh, websites, questionnaires, documentations, even with some interviews in 136 brands, and Tanner is representing 25% of the total turnover in Italy. Um, I'm not, I don't want to, to, to bore you with the, with the details, but we have elaborated three sets of indicators, how much it is important for um, uh, the market. One requirement, this is the, this, indicator, we call it relevance importance index. How much is a brand or a company uh, addressing sustainability in a complete way? And how much is it addressing in a complete way the single core issues? Okay, so it's pretty easy to, to understand. 66 are the brands uh, based in Europe uh, in a research uh, carried out uh, some uh, time ago. Then, uh, thanks to Lina Pell in New York, we have been able to do the same research on 70 US brands and on, as I said, Italian tanneries representing 25% of the turnover. So, just a brief uh, um, overview of the results. We have uh, an average of the general attention index of uh, 35% in European brands, which is a pretty high average. Uh, the Top value is 92%. Of course, these are mainly luxury brands. Luxury is now mo paying more attention than others on the topic. They are kind of guiding the way, paving the way towards uh, this development. Um, th we have 54% of the sample, which is over average, and at least one topic in 85%. Of, of the analyzed companies. If we go on the different uh, uh, topic, you see labor practices, health and safety in the workplace, social dialogue, good working uh, conditions is the most important, followed by uh, the environment and human rights. Top 10 topics, the prevention of pollution, the sustainable resource use, environment and environment, health and safety and work. In general, we have four sets of requirements on human rights, three on labor practices, and three on environmental protection. Pretty easy to understand if you have questions, raise your hand. But same results for the American brands. The general, the average, the general interest is lower. Half of it, half of what we've seen in, uh, in Europe. 
Um, the maximum value is still lower in high-end uh, high high -end brands. We have less companies which are um, uh, performing better than average and uh, less companies that are least are considering one of the topics analyzed. If you see this level here, also the average of comprehensiveness of uh, approaching the different topic is lower um, and the consumer issues are labor practices and human rights are the most important topics. Regarding the single topics, consumer service and the dispute resolution is the number one. And I kind of expected it because we have noticed in the past a very good attention to consumers by American brands. But it's surprising that all the others are performing not very well. In any case, we have three on human rights, two on uh, consumer issues, three on labor practices, and two on environmental protection. Then we have done the same research for Italian companies, and these are the results. 55% is the average, so higher than European brands and higher than American brands. And you will say, okay, you have been uh, asked by Lina Pelle to do this research. So it is obvious now that you're presenting very good results, but I swear to God that, that we, it's exactly the truth and we haven't been cheating on anything. <laughs> uh, the maximum value is very similar to what we've seen in luxury brands. We have 54% of the sample which are over average and almost everybody, there was only one company that was not uh, performing or considering any topic. Now you see a predominance of an environmental protection. This is somehow very clear and very obvious for whom, uh, uh, for people who know the, the tanning industry. Um, um, with Mrs. Bucky we were discussing is from the Roman time that tanneries have, have been put under pressure for environmental protection issues. Uh, in Pompeii, there is an ancient tannery which was already outside the, 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 the walls of the city because they didn't want this stinky industry to be, to be inside, polluting uh, water. But uh, now, of course, the situation is very different, but there is a very high attention on, on the topic. And this is reflected also on, uh, on the single, uh, the single uh, issues where prevention of pollution is the, one, is the number one. But again, we have almost all the different topics that are covered in the top 10 uh, requirements. Uh, just a few conclusions. Sustainability is growing in importance within the leather uh, supply chain, and we consider it to be an irreversible trend. There's not going to be a U-turn uh, in, in any case. There are far too many green labels, and it's difficult for brands to orientate in this deadlose of, uh, of different proposals. Unsustainable practices within the supply chain create high reputational risk on brands. There is a need also to innovate the traditional command and control approach. Risk management seems to be a good angle to look at it. EU brands are showing a higher commitment to sustainability than their United States counterpart. And Italian tunnels are showing the highest commitment to sustainability in the entire sample of the research. So my presentation is finished here. Thank you for listening and uh, I will be sitting in one of these chairs later on for questions. Thank you very much.